Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the programme, part two of our interview with George Clooney, nominated this week for an Oscar. Economic showdown on the world financial markets, political showdown in Italy, and military showdown in Sri Lanka. But first, Europe. 2008 will see the appointment of the first full-time president of the European Council. Tony Blair, Jose Barroso and Bertie Ahern are all said to be interested in the job. So who will be the first president of Europe and what will the job entail? If, as we're told, a ratified Treaty of Lisbon won't actually change much, then what does the creation of this new post really mean? I'm joined today by uh, Margot Wallström, the Vice President of the European Commission, who has herself been mentioned as a key candidate for the job. Madam Vice President, Margot, welcome. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning to you. Um, tell me, this position, we've got the two positions coming up. The, there'll be the President of the Council, the positions talked about now, and the President of the Commission will remain. Um, how will the power be divided? Well, of course, uh, the president will be uh, the leader of the 27, the council of leaders from 27 member states. So it will be uh, the visible um, lead figure for uh, the council of, of European leaders. And uh, he or she will lead uh, the council meetings without having to, at the same time, lead their governments and their, their particular member state. And indeed, You've, you've been mentioned as a possible candidate for this. Uh, is it a job that you would accept? No, I, no, for goodness sake, I am not uh, at all a candidate, but I would like to advocate uh, uh, female names also in the discussion that has already started uh, about um, uh, future leaders uh, of uh, the European Union's uh, institutions and, and the Council. I think it is very important that uh, we also make visible a number of good uh, names of women. Right, and among the candidates, possible candidates we've, we've heard mentioned among the male sector, um, there's uh, Tony Blair been mentioned, of course, and Bertie Ahern. Those are two of the names you've heard too? Well, there are a number of names uh, circulating, and uh, I will not take a position on, on the particular names. I just think that for uh, sort of the, the reputation of, of the European Union and for democracy's sake, I think it's very important that there are a number of, of names and that they include some, uh, some good and strong female names as well. And will there be a real election campaign, do you think, before the before the new new president is chosen? I mean, will it be like a, a campaign in your country or ours? No, you see, we have a very unique uh, construction of, of the European institutions, and uh, the Council, of course, consists of the 27 leaders of the member states, and it means that they choose or elect by qualified majority the new uh, president of, of the Council. Uh, and it means that a lot of this take, uh, takes place sort of behind closed doors and uh, uh, not uh, that much in the open. Uh, so I think that um, that's why it is important also that uh, there is a list of, of uh, good women candidates. Uh, uh, so they will not be openly elected, but we do have um, a, a European Parliament that is directly elected by uh, the European peoples. And, and this is uh, important in the whole picture. So do you think, basically, um, we have a situation here of where providing an answer to that uh, Henry... Henry Kissinger question when he said, if a world power needs to talk to Europe, who do they call? I mean, does it answer that uh, question? Will it, make, will it make Europe more powerful? I am sure that uh, Condoleezza Rice or any other leader know 
where to uh, call uh, to Europe because with the close contact with the very important uh, cooperation that we have between the United States of America and the European Union, uh, we know each other uh, well enough. But of course, this will uh, make us stronger on the global scene if we can speak with one voice. We will have a better chance of coordinating our positions and this will help the Council to, to formulate and to be visible with one uh, face of, of the European Union. And uh, that is the advantage of having uh, a full-time president and also not having to juggle with all the responsibilities uh, at home. So I think it will um, make us stronger uh, on the world scene. Thank you very much, Margot, for being with us this morning. We appreciate it. Talking there Thank of a stronger Europe. Thank you, Margot. And now from Sweden to Sri Lanka, where 2008 is predicted to be one of the island's most bloody, after the government scrapped a six-year truce with the Tamil Tiger rebels last week. The rebels are fighting for an independent state for the Tamil minority in the north and to a lesser extent the east of the island. On the day the ceasefire formally ended, more than 26 people were killed in a bus bomb in the south after months of escalating violence between the two sides. Joining me now, I'm delighted to say, is the Foreign Minister of Sri Lanka, Rohitha Bogalagama, joining us now from Colombo. Welcome, welcome to us. Thank, good to have you with us again. Thank you, Sir David, and it's my pleasure. And the, the report of the, the end of the truce last week, Foreign Minister, um, does it mean that there's a situation, as it were, of full war between the two sides this week? In fact, there's nothing of that sort. In fact, uh, we have never had a proper truce uh, between the LTT uh, terrorists and that of the uh, government. And uh, the ceasefire had been observed by the LTT more in the breach. And this had been discussed over again. And uh, what we had done is we had just got out of the CFA, which had not served its objectives and for what it was created. It only led to the um, LTT being a terrorist organization, a ban organization in a lot, lot of parts of the world, including the EU, including the United States, Canada, and the UK, and India, getting into some degree of parity with that of the government, and ultimately not uh, delivering what it was meant for. So therefore, we have got out of it, and we have now got into a new chapter and a new agenda in the delivery process of the constitutional reforms in Sri Lanka. We have just started the first phase of that with the introduction of the APRC proposals that were handed over to the President of Sri Lanka just two days ago. I think that's a new beginning in the direction of a political solution to be found in Sri Lanka, much away from the objectives for which the CFA was created as a temporary truce which did not serve the objectives. And today I'm happy to say here that we are looking very uh, uh, much uh, encouraged of the uh, polity that has come together in the South towards uh, coming to a consensus in offering a lasting solution to this issue. And uh, do, you, do you think that the proposals that you're going to put forward will be acceptable and bring a settlement with the Tamil Tigers? Do you think that's possible? In fact, this is, these are not proposals that are meant for terrorists to respond, as uh, the LTT belongs to. Uh, but they are proposals for the Tamil polity to become part of and which has been encouraged by the statements that have already been made by the senior Tamil leadership in the country coming from the democratic channels. And uh, several of them have already endorsed the proposals as a step in the right direction. India has endorsed it as a welcome uh, development in Sri Lanka's uh, proposals in terms of the solutions that we are looking at. And thereby we see that greater degree of uh, cooperation getting extended in line with what we have offered in terms of the APRC proposals in its first phase. Will you talk, will you talk to the Tamil Tigers? We are always ready to talk to uh, the Tamil Tigers for the reason that they are part and parcel of Sri Lanka. They are subjects of our country. And there's no issue of why we should not talk to them. But the issue is we need not talk to them in terms of any ceasefires or truces. But we have to talk to them in terms of if they are belonging to the political process of this country. It is how we are going to fashion ourselves. What about this latest news we got of 16 bodies being found in two mass graves 
in the north. In fact, we are aware that we have found these bodies, and in fact, that's the matter that is currently receiving investigation. We don't know to which uh, community, which uh, uh, which uh, individuals these people are. Their identity is not known right now, and therefore, it's uh, currently under investigation. And soon, I think we should be able to reveal their identities. Do you think that, um, in fact, the killing, the deaths, like these two mass graves, that there will be more of that this year? or before peace breaks out? And do you think peace between your government and in the fact, Tamils will happen in the course of this year or not? In fact, it has already uh, happened to a large extent, except for in two province, uh, two uh, districts, that is Kilinochi and Mulatil, where still the LTT is holding ground. And except for that, in 23 districts or uh, 23 districts, we have the uh, total uh, civil administration. People are getting about with their day-to-day -day needs. And uh, the pursuit for economic advancement is now taking place. And thereby, the issue of how fast we could get the other two districts liberated uh, from the clutches of the terrorists. And towards that, I think we are working very hard. And I'm sure within a short time, we should be able to realize that goal as well. And usher a sustainable and honorable peace in our country to our people. Yes, the government in Japan said that it would review its aid pa package to Sri Lanka if you follow a, a military course. What is your message to them and the world about your, your intentions, your peaceful intentions or maybe your military intentions? In fact, we had the uh, special envoy of uh, the Japanese government uh, Ambassador Akashi in Sri Lanka two weeks ago. And he had a quite a good uh, visit. Uh, and he discussed matters with uh, our president, Prime Minister, and myself as well. And uh, I think he was quite pleased to find that we are on the right track in looking at a political agenda rather than a military solution to the issues. Our president went on record two days ago in addressing the APRC or the All-Party Representative Committee, at the time they were handing over the proposals and he said that, I quote, that the political issues have to be resolved politically and not through the military means. And we believe in that direction. At the same time, counterintegrism lies in terms of a military effort. So these are two issues. And we are quite um, uh, pleased to say that we are segregated one from the other and we are very focused in terms of bringing only the political solutions and a political agenda would prevail towards that. No military agenda would prevail in that direction. That's a very clear statement there about the, the two parties talking and not a military solution. Foreign Minister Rohitha, we thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Thank you, Sir David, for the opportunity and keep in touch. Our pleasure. Thank, thank you. you very much. Our thanks there. That coming from Colombo. In a moment, is the global economy really in for a meltdown or has it been exaggerated? Join me for an incredibly authoritative answer to that question uh, after this break. <laughs>